13 Questions by Man Transcending Manhood in the Digital Age Welcome back to 13 Questions. Today we are going to be interviewing Darren Grimes of the Gray America Show podcast. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. On it, Darren really got me thinking about my own unlived potential and shortcomings. Uh, anyways, this is one of my favorite episodes to date, and if you haven't signed up to be a member yet, it's probably a good one to start off with. Uh, all the interviews are great, but I really enjoyed doing the uh, the bonus questions with Darren on this one. Darren, if you don't know about him, he is a husband and father who's centered around his family. By day, he manages high construction steel workers overlooking the Canadian landscape. By night, he is a family man, professional podcaster, networking guru, and amateur horticulturist. He is the creator of the Gray America Show and 13 Questions podcast, of which he is host of both. Darren's interest includes simulation theory, synchronicities, self-improvement, global catastrophe cycles, and many other subjects he addresses weekly on his podcasts. With an eye on personal growth, truth, and helping others, Darren is a mentor to many. And that's Darren Grimes. So that'll be coming up. If you would like to become a member and get access to the bonus questions after the 13, you can go to 13questionspodcast.com to sign up. You get over $200 worth of communication courses by TJ Walker. You can join the community forums, receive prompted uh, writing exercises in your email. You get the opportunity to record your own uh, 13 Questions podcast with a friend, a family member, or anybody that you think would be a great guest for the show. If your audio quality is good, then we'll go ahead and toss it into the feed. Uh, we've already got our first listener submission. And I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, it's going to be into the feed in the near future. So keep an eye out. Um, and when you do this, you know, something that we've realized along the way is that everybody has stood on the shoulder of giants when it comes to advice. And we've had no bad interviews yet. So when you go forward, you know, just just know that everybody's got a, a depth of knowledge that goes back generations. All right, guys, thank you for being part of 13 Questions. I hope you enjoy this interview from my friend and mentor, Darren Grimes. All right, welcome back to 13 Questions. Today we're going to be air interviewing Darren Grimes. How's it going, Darren? Pretty good. Yeah, a little nervous. I was never expecting to have to answer these questions myself. Well, and you've had an extra long time to mull them over and hear other people's answers. So a little, little bit more weight above it. Well, that's part of the thing I'm nervous about is because I may pick the questions and everything else. So it's like, should I have better, good or great answers? Because I don't feel like my answers are going to stand up to the answers I've heard through the first 13 episodes that have been released and i mean i've i've heard even more episodes than that because i've heard all of them that have been recorded so i think we're at almost 20 so i mean i i mean i don't i don't think i think my answers will be the worst yeah, all, so far all that matters is the uh the, the one the one answer that gives somebody a new perspective that speaks to them so i've had a few of those i'm sure you'll have one of those for somebody today all right darren what was the best advice ever given to you? And would you modify it at all today? Uh, you know, this one was a little tricky. I, I jumped around a little bit, but I think if I really think about it, I can't remember. I mean, I've been told this by countless people, mostly when I was in the early grades, and that's to treat others the way you want to want to be treated. Um, it seems simple, really does, but I would say that, you know, over 99.9% .9 of us aren't doing that. And even those of us who are doing it, maybe maybe we're doing it 20 or 30 or 40% of the time. And if we're really, really trying, maybe we're doing it 60% of the time. But I don't feel like anyone's really doing it all the time, or at least not uh, as well as they could be. And and that that just that will make a huge difference. Um, in in your life just just being kind to people you know and you can still be kind to someone and not agree with them or be kind to them and maybe criticize them a little bit but 
it's going to come from, it's going to carry a lot more weight if, if it comes from a place of kindness and cases instead of a place of criticism or resentment or anything else. And I mean, that one, and I, I went back and forth between that one and just canceling your cable. And the reason being is because like when I, I remember when people telling me they didn't have a TV or they didn't have cable and I was just like, what the fuck? How is that even possible? And I mean, I haven't had, I don't know, it's been years that I haven't had cable and now I don't even have a TV. At, I mean, we have a couple of TVs at the studio here, but I don't have a TV in my house. We've got computers. We could watch Netflix once in a while and stuff like that. But it's really not that much of a thing, you know? And when I think back to how crazy I thought it would be to cancel your cable or to not have a television, and now I just think of it as it seems crazy to have one because it's just hours and hours and hours. I mean, the fun little experiment to do is just add up how many hours a day you're watching television on average, times that by seven and times that by 50, and then take that number and times it by, I don't know, $25 an hour. And that's how much, you know, whatever you think your time is worth. And that's how much you're spending to watch TV, in my opinion. See, I always wait it and worry. You know, you'd spend the time watching the news, what's going on with North Korea, different country, some conflict. And if I took my teenage self from Desert Storm to today, cut myself out from the news and went to an island, my life is still going to go on. The United States is still here. There's still an economy. And all of that, you know, decades of, of attention and time is just worry and stress about what, you know, a, a reality that's not directly affecting you at the moment. Yeah. And even if all you're watching is funny sitcoms and laughing, I mean, I would argue you're still wasting that time. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with watching a couple hours of television a week, you know, having a, watching a movie or two a week, you know, maybe you have two movie nights a week. Maybe you're, you have a show that you watch together or a couple shows you watch. But I, I think, you know, you shouldn't be watching TV every day and you shouldn't be watching TV hours and hours every day. And if you are, it's, I think you should take a look at that. Yeah. You need to think of thoughts as nutrition. You know, what are you going to put into your body? That's right. What is the most important lesson you learned from your parents? Um, probably to, that I was going to be around for my kids all the time. Uh, my mom was always around, but my dad wasn't. Um, so, I mean, I've just sort of started talking to my dad again after not ever really having a relationship with him my entire life. So that kind of, and, and I didn't start talking to him until well after I had my kids, you know, four or five years after I had my second child, my second daughter, Cassandra. And, but it was still kind of there that, you know, my kids were never going to have that wondering who their dad was or where their dad was or what he was like or anything like that, that, uh, um, above all that I was gonna, gonna be around for them. And I mean, that's not always as easy as it sounds. Um, you know, being, a being in a, in, in a intimate relationship with a wife these days, I mean, it's tough for people. It's tough. The world isn't, isn't made for that. We weren't made to have so much things to compare to and, and all that stuff. And, and it's a tough world, but, uh, luckily I've got a wife who's dedicated as I am to, you know, making our relationship work, even though that isn't always pretty and it isn't always easy, but being able to, to kind of put your pride aside and, and get through the, the tough stuff. And I think it's important for your kids to see that in a lot of ways too, that, you know, push back against that throwaway culture that relationships are worth fighting for. And, uh, I mean, yeah, that's pretty important. Well, and just being around the amount of knowledge, you know, the, the lessons that you've learned that you can pass on, you know, keep you from making the same left turns and mistakes and getting stuck in a pothole. You know, it, it's the most, some of the most important things, memories in my life are just words of advice that somebody gave me that I had a reason to believe in them. And if you can be that person for your kids, that's, I mean, it's almost the greatest thing you can give somebody in life. Yeah. And I think, I mean, just that right now, one of the things I'm really into is, is that just the dynamic of relationships and where they exist. I've been listening to Hetty a little bit lately. I can't remember her last name, but she talks about how, and it's when you really think about it, all those relationships do exist and, 
in the metaphysical realm, sort of, you know, they're not in me, they're not in you. They're in that, even this conversation we're having, it exists, you know, I could start being a total fucking prick to you right now. And, you know, it could get awkward and weird. It would be that space in between us is, is, is polluted or, or it's where the moment lives. It's where the, the, the interaction, the emotion between us, it's, it's not in my head. It's not in yours. It's somewhere in between. In a lot of ways, that's where the present is, mm-hmm. right? It's, you know, when you can find that, you're, you're real close to the present. So it kind of, you know, you could, is it easy? It makes you wonder if it's easier to find present moment with someone else than by yourself. Because you can do that just by giving into that relation or relationship, just give into that conversation or whatever you guys are doing, just be there and leave everything else behind. Is that easier than? I mean, I guess it's easy to go sit under a tree and think of nothing too, but I, that's not as easy for me as it sounds. No, I love that. And it, it reminds me of scrying, you know, when you focus your mind or reading leaves, you're, you're putting your thoughts somewhere outside of yourself into another spot, uh, an in-between. And that could be super powerful between two beings, putting that attention in between. I love it. What book has been most influential on your life and why? Uh, I went with two. I went with No More Mr. Nice Guy uh, by Dr. Robert Glover, who I've had the the pleasure of talking with a couple of times. That's the beauty about having a podcast. I get to read these books and think they're great and, mm-hmm. and track down the author and interview him. But that one was a big one for me. I mean, that one probably saved my marriage uh, for sure because I was kind of in a place of denial. And I, I, I mean, I've read a lot of books. I've read, I've read a lot of books on relationships, most of them. Uh, Love and Respect was a really good one. Um, John Gray has a whole bunch of pretty Love good John ones. Gray. And all uh, you know what else is a really good one? The Stan Tatkin one, uh, Wired for Love, which actually talks about the, like, the neurochemistry and how your brain's developed and, and things like that. So you can... Anyway, all of them kind of give you a pretty good overarching idea of how to navigate relationships. And how the differences between men and women. But No More Mr. Nice Guy was a lot more of a drill down into your subconscious. And I mean, I recommend that all, all men read it. You, you might not be a nice guy, but I think you should read it just to, just to make sure. Because <laughs> you can really get stuck in that rut where you, you get um, stuck in that sort of... I mean, part of it, you can be in that victim role. Part of it is you're, you're not being honest. You're not being... Um, you're not being authentic. Uh, you just lie to yourself, and and it'll 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 pollute all those relationships. And and I had kind of noticed that pattern in all of my relationships that when they hit a certain point, they just started to fall apart. And I'd always blame that on them, and blame that on them, and blame that on on them. And uh, reading that book made me take a lot more accountability for where I was at. And it comes with a bunch of exercises and activities you can go through to kind of sort yourself out. And I'm actually going to read it again soon because, uh, you got to read it again. And once on, I'm going to do the activities again, uh, because I can see myself slipping on some of those things and, and I, I don't want to slip on those things anymore. So, has your, um, has your wife read it? Uh, she is read. She, well, what I did is I read it and I highlighted all the like parts that really resonated with me. And I, then she went through and, and read those. Awesome. And, and the other book I think, and I would love to interview this guy, but he's dead is uh, think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill. <sighs> yeah. Um, that's kind of one of those ones where you can read all the new age books or you can just read think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill because this thing was written almost a hundred years ago. Um, it was endorsed by Thomas Edison, Woodrow Wilson, Henry Ford, uh, you name it. And it's not what you think you, you read it. And it's funny because I remember when my, my wife first seen it and she was like, you know, kind of the, the eye roll. And I was like, it's not what you think. I'm telling you, it's not what you think. And, uh, and everyone kind of, you assume it's that classic book on success and and that, and it's not that at all. I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but I think you should read it. I think that those are two. That's that's one book. I mean, no more Mr. Nice Guy. You can't be reading in high school. I don't think you're probably a little young. Probably you should read No More Mr. Nice Guy when you're like 25. I think they say around 25 or 27 is when your personality is sort of formed. But I mean, maybe you should read that in high school. I don't know. 
I don't know if I was a nice guy and I definitely wouldn't have had the self-awareness <laughs> yeah. to realize yeah. I had any of that in high school. I think you got to be in your late 20s. I mean, your that's in still, my it's case. Your still developing, so you, you know, you're structurally thinking different anyhow. But Think and Grow Rich, I think, should be on the high school agenda because it's like, yep. I mean, when it's, it's telling you stuff like, like add value to the world. Don't think about making money. Think about adding value. Think about making people's lives better. Think about being of service and, and all those sorts of things. And also, um, I mean, just being nice, nice to people. There's, there's, it's kind of that thing where you're just, if you, if you just do things right and, and, and the other, the other big part of it is intention, which I'm a big believer in is intention and manifestation. Uh, and a hundred years ago, this guy's writing about that kind of stuff. I mean, I could, I could put a hundred books into this question because I've, I've almost always listened to an audio book. Then you could also keep people from reading a hundred <laughs> books by reading this one. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's like you said, it seems like all the new age work was kind of based on this. What daily habits or rituals do you have? And do you recommend them for others? Mm, well, currently, I always have a coffee in the morning, which I probably wouldn't recommend to others. It does turn into like an addiction for sure. I know like the other day I was on night shift for a couple of days. So I was on like a weird schedule and I had to run out. I had to get up earlier than I wanted and I was out of coffee at home and I had to go a little while without a coffee. And it's like, Within like three or four hours of waking up, if I haven't had a coffee, I've got a headache now. And I'm going to have to deal with this headache until I can find a way to get some caffeine into me. Um, so I, I wouldn't recommend that to others. If you're not on the coffee thing now and you don't feel like you need to be, uh, probably don't because it, it does become, it becomes a thing. Uh, another one is an evening tea, which I'm not as good at. My wife and I try and have a cup of tea before bed. Uh, sleep tea or a calm down tea or something like that, uh, which we'd probably, we're probably doing about 80% of the time, which is good. It's a nice little routine to get into. Uh, the tea helps you sleep, helps you wind down. And it's just a nice little way to calm down and have a conversation or do something besides when you don't have a television, you got to find things to do. And then the other thing I'm, I'm, I try and listen to something, um, so that I can learn something at least, you know, a half an hour a day. If I were to ask your best friend, what is the one thing they would say you need to work on the most and why? Uh, probably being on time would be one of them for sure. I'm always about 10 minutes late for everything, whether it's work or podcast or it doesn't matter. I don't give, you know, it seems like no matter what I do, I, I have trouble finding myself any place on time i've been getting a little better than that late at that lately uh but i could still be better my wife would probably say the other thing would be that i need to i need to learn to relax a little bit like especially when i'm sick i just can't stop i can't it's hard for me if i'm just even if i'm just sitting on the couch i'll grab my phone and start <coughs> doing something reading something or posting something for the podcast or doing something for work in my email or something. Or if I'm trying to, I'll have a day where I'm just going to laze around the house and the next thing you know, I'm doing the laundry and the dishes or I'm outside cleaning the yard or I just can't, I have a lot of trouble winding down, which helps me out in a lot of ways, but you know, you got to find some time to relax once in a while too. And I don't seem to be real good at that. And it's, especially when I'm sick. So now my cold is going to last me four days and it's going to last my wife one day. Because she had the good sense to just, you know, yeah. relax for the day. And I'm just go, 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 thinking I'm getting the upper hand by fighting through it. But really, if I just took that one day at, you know, 40% instead of three, four days at 75%. Did you ever do any <laughs> meditation? Try to maybe, you know, give yourself a stopgap in that, uh, that go, go, go? No, I've been trying to just sort of start meditation. I was actually supposed to meditate this morning and I, and I didn't, but I have no affiliation, but there's a good app called insight timer, which, um, is guided meditations that I've started using that you can go on and people post their own for free. So it's a, a very large community of, of, 
open. I can send you a couple that I've been using that I've really liked. Yeah, yeah, do it. I, that's definitely something I'm trying to add to my to my routine. I, I could use it. I mean, I wanted yoga to be part of them too, but I got two young kids and a bucket full of excuses. Then you need to get. I'm 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 not joking. You need to get yourself a Wii, find it used, and do the yoga poses on it. You can track your weight. You can do all sorts of you know cool things and. You know, once you start doing that, you're going to hop off that thing and go for extreme stuff, I'm sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I've got the yoga videos and everything now and the mat at home. It's just, you know, doing it. It's just doing it. And I can, like I say, I got a bucket of excuses. Get the kids involved, man. But none and of them are start, very and good. And they'll start bugging you. Yeah, they do a bit too. They're probably, well, they don't do as much as me. But I don't do as much as I should. I don't do enough to call it practice. That's for sure. I mean, when I was thinking about answering that question, I can't put it on there even though I want to, but I can't. What are you most curious about? Uh, probably what humans are capable of. That's the long end. What our brains are capable of. You know, what the long end of placebo and nocebo and intention and all that. Where does all that end up? Cause it seems like we're, you know, if, if we can do what we're doing and the culture we're in dabbling makes me wonder what you could do if you brought up in a culture that from the get go that taught you that all of those things were possible. Yeah. I always used to wonder as a kid, you know, if everybody on earth is wiped out and there was one person left, you know, what would the power of that one thought be on creation? Yeah, exactly. Or if they really believe that their thoughts could affect creation, like 100%, like 100% with every ounce of their being. What was the most embarrassing experience of your life? Hmm. I'm pretty tough to embarrass. Um, I know one would probably be be when I was a kid and I got caught talking to myself in the mirror. I used to like have a friend in the mirror. My reflection was like my friend and I'd be talking to it all the time. And I remember one time, I guess I didn't lock the door and, and my stepdad came in and I was there yapping away. And it was just like, like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you know, what's funny is I remember like after he left and closed the door, explaining to my reflection that that was who that was. You ever find yourself doing that, chatting in the mirror when you're shaving or anything? No, not anymore. I don't think I did it a whole lot after I got caught, actually. Scared straight. I used to wonder <laughs> if there was a whole like world behind the mirror, though, you know? Well, it's interesting. You found another world behind the mirror. I did. For a while, anyway. What is your greatest fear, and how did you overcome it? Um, probably not living up to my potential would be one of them. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my, I, I waste, I'll say I wasted a lot of time drinking and carrying on and doing drugs and, and doing stuff that, you know, I, I wouldn't say you shouldn't do, but you definitely shouldn't do them to the extent that I was doing them. Right. And, and you shouldn't be doing them, you know, full out every weekend for a decade or anything like that. You know, you just, it really set me back from where I could be. And uh, now I, I'm trying to make that time up because I think we're all, everyone's got, everyone's potential is probably a lot higher than they, they think it is. And I've got, I've got a, some, some pretty lofty goals and I don't think any of them are out of the realm of possibility if I, if I just dedicate myself to them. So, I mean. That's probably, probably a lot of that not stopping is, is that fear of not living up to my potential. Every person who's done any, every, anything great has had that thought and idea, that pie in the sky, and they went for it, and they found a way. So, you know, everybody puts their pants on the same way. You can find a path. What, you know, what, what's your goal, and how are you getting there? It's kind of what I love about Napoleon Hill. You know, it's, it's almost a, a roadmap to thinking. Yeah, I had a lot of people when I was a kid tell me that I was wasting my potential or going nowhere or this or that. So, I mean, now that's kind of my my driving force What to not do that. What quality do you most admire in a man and why? Um, 
I mean, all honesty, integrity, leadership, all those main ones. But I think, I think you got to kind of have all that and have a certain softness to you. You need to be approachable by everyone. You know, when I was younger, I used to think that it would be a thing to be like, to be that guy that everyone's kind of nervous around and scared to talk to, but they'll do whatever he says and they respect him at the same time. But now, now that I'm a little bit older, I think it, it's the opposite of that. You'd, you you want to be that guy that that everyone trusts and everyone looks to and everyone will listen to and you know or everyone will not listen to but will this will respect as a leader you know and uh, will look to but also have that softness to you that anyone's going to approach you whether it's a kid or a coworker or uh, uh, anything you know a stranger I'd be be approachable be very soft and approachable and soft spoken and kind. Who were and are your role models and why? Uh, well, when I was younger, I didn't, my dad wasn't around. So I, I think I developed this weird thing of, um, of looking for approval, seeking approval in a lot of different places, which, uh, especially from men, which kind of, I think you could which is a problem, not a good, great thing. But at the same time, I could, I can kind of, when I started thinking about a role model, I could think of a few like Ben Grundy over at Mysterious Universe, definitely be one of them. Uh, the No Agenda guys, what they're doing for podcasting, Joe Rogan. I mean, all these guys that are doing great things for podcasting be part of it. But at, at some extent, I think my approval seeking of has because it's like a lot of dudes, when I meet them, I'll, I'll just, I'll start to, everyone's got something that they're that they're real good at so you can start to notice those little things and in some ways everyone becomes like a micro role model for me so it's like you know this guy's real good at doing that and this guy you know he drives me crazy in most ways but he's also real good at this and you know just little things like that start looking at everyone as a role model and what you can learn from from everyone Nothing. even people that you that you don't like i love it not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, kind of you know, looking through, seeing where the nuggets are. Broken clocks are, I like to say broken clocks are right twice a day. So as crazy as I think somebody is, I'll listen. And if there's value, I'll put it in my toolbox. That's right. What institution of society or structural aspect of modern life would you change given the chance? Uh, education, 100%. A hundred percent. Like I was talking about before, I would think books like Napoleon Hill should be read in school. There's also some the thing to talk about, like um, certain hallucinogens, like psilocybin mushrooms and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not telling kids to eat mushrooms, but maybe as a culture, we should be, you know, just as a thought. We used to have like initiation and stuff like that, especially for for boys. And I think a lot of that's gone and the places are looking for initiation now in the schoolyard and online and in gangs or whatever the fuck, video games, you name it. We're looking for <clears throat> We're looking for that initiation into manhood in all the wrong places. And, uh, and just the whole education system, like I didn't, I didn't learn until I was fucking 30 that, you know, you could really just, I mean, you kind of learn it. But you don't really learn it's a real possibility to just go start your own business and do your own thing. And I mean, I was 35 before I started thinking. I, mean, I was around 30, I started having the inkling that I could do this or that. But it was around 35 that I started really thinking, like, you know, the only thing that, and I, what I really think now is the only thing that separates the people that are doing what they want for a living and the people that aren't is mindset. And the people that want to do what they're doing for a living just went out and did that. And they didn't take no for an answer. And they didn't get, oh, I'm going to go do this for a couple of years. Or they didn't get caught up in that. No. And I think there's there's a lot to that. And you, you know, and you look at a place like Canada, and I'm, I probably have this stat wrong because I'm getting it off the top of my head. But it's something like 9 out of 10 business owners are either immigrants or fucking high school dropouts. So, I mean, that tells you something. A, I talked to my Lebanese buddy and he's like, we get taught in school growing up that working for someone is always secondary and working for yourself is always ideal so anytime you're working for someone else it's on the way of getting to working for yourself and uh and that's yeah that, that just kind of stuck with me because i didn't get taught any of that in school 
you know, and you notice and you know, you wonder why you see third, fourth, fifth generation business owners is because they're getting taught that from their parents. And if you're not in that game, then you got to try and figure it out for yourself and you're not learning that in school or anything like that. And you're just getting taught these highly specialized skills. Well, you know what? Highly specialized skills are a dime a fucking dozen. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that engineers and doctors or anything like that programmers, you name it, aren't valuable to society. They're hundred percent valuable and we couldn't do anything without them. But we get taught that if you don't get, if you're not one of those things, you're not going to be anything. And I'm going to say that, you know, you can hire those people and, and, uh, vision is, is a lot in a lot shorter supply than specialized skill. Yeah. And you have a system that's set up to kind of funnel people into that, you know, net them in with, with debt and different things. I know when I was in high school, I got a credit card at like 16 or 17. I wasn't even 18 yet. They had people on campus signing kids up, giving out t-shirts and such. And, you know, it's a system that, you know, it's a lot harder to break free and go and do your thing once you're, you know, you're hobbled underneath the education's, you know, uh, you know, thumb of payback. And now adds, yeah, it's disgusting. So I would just get rid of all that and restart it. What is the most courageous thing you have ever done or seen in your life? Uh, the most courageous thing I've ever done is probably taking second and third chances at my marriage. Um, you know, even when, when some people are telling you that you shouldn't, uh, I don't believe that. I believe, you know, that, that that's the most important thing you can do. I, I don't think, and I'm not saying all the time there's toxic relationships out there that you shouldn't be in, but I'm saying if you, if you're, if you're in some pattern, you're probably just going to fall into that pattern again with the next person. And that's what I know. I noticed to myself is, you know, I really think back, all my relationships sort of ended that way. So why would the next one, you know, mm -hmm. the grass, you know, it's not the person it's probably in you. Um, so I would say that having the courage to, to take, take, take the ownership and, uh, and, and, uh, and, the just the decision to, to keep, keep at, keep at your marriage when it's, when society and, and it's easier and everything else is telling you just fuck it, walk away. But I mean, I really think that in the long run, you'll be happy you did. And it was good to do that in front of your kids to kind of give them a, a vision of how adults can rectify and get along. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think we're heading in a good direction here right now with the whole, I just don't think we're heading in a good direction right now as a society with the, with the lack of attention where, I mean, not just on intimate relationships on relationships in general and social media and the internet isn't helping that. But there's no real respect for anyone anymore. That's a problem. I mean, if you can't, yeah, that's a problem. What rule do you have for yourself that you never break, and why do you think that is? Uh, to always work hard, especially like uh, at at work. I don't always. I'm, I can be lazy in a lot of ways, but when I'm on the clock, um, I'm not a dog fucker. Whether it's whether it's podcast or my day job or helping a buddy do this or that. If I'm on the clock, so to speak, I'm, I'm going 110% and uh, trying to make sure that everyone around me is doing that at the same time. That's probably why, I mean, seems like any place I've, all my day jobs, I sort of ended up being a lead hand or a supervisor or a manager eventually. And I would say that's probably, um, I would say that's probably a re, uh, consequence of that. So I would say that's why it's why it's important. Lead by example. Um, yeah, not only that, it just makes you feel good when you go home at the end of the day and you and you didn't fuck the dog. What qualities should a man strive for in today's world? Um. Well, above all, I would say authenticity. Um for sure but then you need to get to a place where you where kindness comes authentically which might require a lot of self-work and not getting triggered and and all that a lot of patience for sure 
are all things you need so that you can be authentic because I mean, being authentic means being authentic. So when you're triggered, you got to kind of let people be a dick or let people, you know, you got to, you got to not act not triggered when you're triggered or you're not being authentic. So if you, you, you got to kind of keep the kindness and the patience and the self work, self realization in line with that, with the authenticity so that you're not getting triggered all the time. And that's going to be toughest with the people that you care about the most and the people you spend the most time with. That's the shitty thing about that. Is that, you you know, it's real easy to be authentic with, with the guy you only see once or twice a week because he's not triggering you. But you know, the guy you see every day or your, your wife or your kids, they're going to be, they're going to be pretty good at triggering you because I mean, a lot of expectation there. Well, especially when you live together so close, there's, you know, certain things that are agreed upon that are right. And if you you're doing something that falls out of that, you're going to get face judgment by a group and you feel bad. But if you're with your buddies, there's a little more just leniency in in how that goes. So, yeah, I can understand it's 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 a it's a weird pressure of having, you know, an honest uh, family relationship. Yeah, it is important. It's important to keep keep at keep trying at and uh i mean it all it, at the end of the day it's just gonna 90 percent of your problems 95 percent of your problems are going to be internal and if you can sort of go in and figure out what they are and why they are what's causing them and and that then you can you can learn how to at least manage it a little better I mean, never get perfect as near as I can tell. That's the one thing I figured out opening up this can of worms of um, trying to be a better person is that it's, it, it's not a project. It's a lifestyle. The house is never finished. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. Yeah. Well, Darren, that was the end of the 13 questions. So, yeah. It was awesome. I mean, we're going to do the bonus questions here in a second, but for the regular listeners, that'll be it. But if you want, you can head over over to 13questionspodcast.com. There you can sign up, be a member. We've got uh, access to the premium podcast, which is coming up. Also, communication courses by TJ Walker. A few hundred dollars were there. Uh, Amazing. Go through that. Really uh, well thought out courses. Uh, You also get prompted journaling exercises emailed to you. And of course, we have uh, some forums over there. All right, Darren, you ready for the bonus? Sounds good. Sweet. What would you tell your teenage self? Um, I would probably, now there's a lot to be said for Duncan's answer of nothing. Uh, that really made me think, but I would probably say, don't spend your twenties being an alcoholic. That's something I really, uh, that really sits with me, you know, when I look at my financial situation and just where I am in a lot of ways, if I could have just spent my 20s differently, even half. you help your brother when you see him fall why do we act like god don't see it all why do we call them black them white them asians and use labels now that's racism 
I don't wanna hold my name. I don't wanna hold my name. No why? I don't wanna hold my name. I don't wanna hold my name. No why? I don't wanna hold my name. I don't wanna hold my name. No why? I don't wanna hold my name. I don't wanna hold my name. No why? Is it innocent people locked up for life? While some people can't say nothing nice. Why do we always got a question with all of the means? And why won't you follow your dreams? Tell me why. The night when you took my dad. Why'd you let me see my grandpa cry? And tell me why. And why do you choose to hide? Even though you was born to fly. And tell me why. And why don't we turn from all the hate? And why don't we learn from all mistakes? Why do I keep on wrecking these fat beats? And teachers don't make more than professional athletes. And why? This should be considered entertainment and not therapy. We hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.